Knight from US Army Research Lab. He has known him for a long time. Yeah. And he graduated uh, from Georgia Tech. Uh, he's also been teaching at the National Defense University. Right. So um, today he's going to talk about uh, imaging, I guess. Yep. So uh, thank you for coming. OK. Thank you for inviting me. Um, and the, this talk kind of has two parts. I mean, I, I start with this image right here. You can see the you know, telescope is about 400 years old. Uh, you know, we've got it right there. And I start my talk with a historical perspective on imaging. Try to lead you through the uh, advances in technology that, uh, that actually started here and led up to you know, what we understand as optical engineering. Uh, but use that as a jumping off point to take a look at modern technologies that are shaping the way we look at imaging systems. And um, I mean, as, as I have talked to people here today, I mean, a lot of this stuff goes back to the work that Tom Cathy and Ed Dowski did uh, in the, in the mid-90s. Uh, it was work that was done in collaboration. Some of it was done in collaboration with ARL. And I'll show you how we're taking some of those ideas <clears throat> that were developed here and I'm pushing it off into um, a different part of the spectrum. There we go. Um, talk about what it is I would like to do in millimeter wave imaging. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't have, I have two view graphs here. I am from the Army Research Laboratory. Um, we are the Army's corporate laboratory for, for the scientific work. Uh, there is medical research that goes on. Uh, that's, that's in the organization that contains Walter Reed. There's also the Corps of Engineers. You know, they do waterways, they do other things. But what we here understand is research. We are the Army's corporate laboratory. We have two major sites. I'm located at Adelphi, Maryland. It's just outside, literally just outside the Beltway in Washington. We're very close to the University of Maryland, if you know anything about the area. Uh, this is where the laboratory is headquartered. We also have another major site north of Baltimore at Aberdeen Proving Ground. Um, the way the laboratory is set up, we have uh, six what I call executing directorates. They cover, um, I mean, you have traditional electrical engineering kinds of things, computational information sciences, sensors and electron devices, where I'm from. We had this, uh, we do do weapons research, but there's also materials research. Vehicle technology is just that. It's, it was primarily rotorcraft helicopters. Um, they're doing more robotic technology now. Human research and engineering, think of it as human factors. This is an interesting group, survivability and lethality. They blow things up. Uh, what they do is they test weapons to see you know, how lethal they are. And if you're designing armor to protect a soldier from an IED, you want to know just how survivable that is. Uh, some of the faculty here are probably familiar with the Army Research Office. They are part of ARL. Uh, this is the group that has money to give to, you, uh, to faculty for research. We do not. I do get a lot of phone calls, you know, do I have money? And the answer is no. And I always end up sending people down there. So that's who we are. This is who I am. As Raphael said, Georgia Tech, 1985. My advisor was Bill Rhodes, who spent, uh, I forget how many years here, um, gosh, in the, in the late 90s, right? Um, when I got my degree, I spent a little bit of time in academia, went to University of Virginia. I'll keep it short and sweet, wrong place, wrong time. Um, and started my career at ARL. Um, 
had a number of interesting positions. Um, this was actually intended as a postdoc. I did go to Erlangen in Germany, where uh, computer-generated holography, Otto Flohmann, was, where he invented that, spent some time there. They invited me back, uh, was an adjunct at the University of Maryland. And as Raphael indicated, I went to the National Defense University. Um, I'm going to talk about this. I, one of the things I said to Raphael, in putting this talk together, I felt that I had to make an apology. Because first off, I'm coming to Colorado, where a lot of this work really started. Second, I've had a lot of ideas about how to use computational imaging. And the thing is, I haven't been able to do much of that for two reasons. Um, I'll point to this one here and then this one here. Um, was doing what I consider real research. Uh, the group that I had built up sort of fell apart, both due to the telecom boom and bust. We, we lost a lot of people. I needed a change. And I went off to the National Defense University, which is in Washington. It is a university for senior military. I was assigned to the Center for Technology and National Security Policy, uh, which was very interesting. It gave me a, sort of an inside the Pentagon view or, or how they view technology. Uh, it was a very interesting time. My first day on the job was September 10th, 2001. And I was supposed to have a meeting uh, I was supposed to have a meeting in the Pentagon the next day, and it moved up one day. Uh, we were actually across the river from the, from the Pentagon, uh, so I had a front row to history. And much of what I did was concerned about using technology as we went into Afghanistan and Iraq. And you know, later, we can talk about what I learned there. One of the things that I learned is that I'm an engineer, and the policy world wasn't I didn't quite have the skills for the policy world, so I went back to my position at ARL. And when I went back, I went back fully committed to computational imaging for millimeter waves. And that was just about the time that the laboratory decided they needed a new program in robotics. I have another presentation I can tell you all about this microautonomous systems and technology. And I have no background in robotics, so I was the perfect person to lead this program. Uh, and that really did start just about then. It was awarded, so I had to define the program, go through source selection. Uh, we awarded the program one year ago. And uh, in the past year, I have spent the majority of my time doing program management and very little research, which is why when I get to the part of the talk where I'm talking about millimeter wave imaging and computational imaging, the results are kind of paltry. I don't have a lot. Now, after a year of pushing hard on these people, uh, I have noticed within the past month my, my management level has gone down. So uh, I really hope that you know, in a year from now, I'll have more results. Um, so it's a little apology, a little bit of who I am. And let's get into imaging sensors. This quote is about three years old now. Uh, it's a good place to start in terms of looking at technology. Uh, makes an analogy to the horse-drawn carriage and what cars were first called. You know, they were horseless carriages. And if you consider where we are now in, ter in terms of cameras and digital cameras, we're going to see, I predict, we will see a similar sort of advance. So we started with you know, the horse drawn and the horseless carriage. This is really just a better one of those, which pulls in comparison to what we have now. And if you look at the different types of vehicles that are out there, there are two major trends here. One is specialization of these vehicles, and then uh, autonomy. So, you know, the, the question is, what's going to happen? I mean, the digital cameras we have right now really are filmless cameras. 
All we've done is taken the, you know, this photochemical process that, that takes place back here and we've replaced it with something that's digital. Now, that, uh, I'll talk about that, what that means in terms of, in terms of design and talk about some of, you know, what that specialization will be. So let's go back in history. Imaging had been observed, uh, has been observed for quite some time. Uh, looking at properly shaped uh, crystals, you know, looking through uh, a goblet filled with water. I mean, this goes back, you know, to, to the, the, uh, the, you know, the time of Christ. Um, and even here, the observation that if you, you know, looked at what we would, through what we would now call a lens, you would see uh, an improvement in vision. This is important. These dates here, uh, Al Hazan, who um, has the first description of a pinhole camera about the turn of the first millennium, his work you know, after the Crusades, we brought all that information back. It was translated into Latin. So this appears about 1270. He also understood the anatomy of the eye. And at about that time, spectacles start to appear. Now, this is a picture from 1582, but you know, it shows you people started understanding what you could do with glass. Now, it's interesting. I mean, what we have here is an optical instrument for enhancing human vision. It's seen as the first optical instrument, but it's really it's a mechanical solution to a packaging problem. How do you take properly shaped pieces of glass and put them in front of somebody's eye. I mean, it's biologically constrained. We have two eyes. And how do you get that onto the face? So it's, it's a packaging problem. It's really not, we kn people knew that you could take a lens and you could put it up in front of your eye. How do you hold it there? Thus, you have spectacles. OK, so enhancing uh, human vision, then you get into the beginning of optical engineering, seeing farther, seeing smaller. We have the telescope, we have the microscope. And this is an interesting question. The packaging technology was available. People knew that you could mount lenses into metal. And the spectacles are a parallel optical system. So why did it take 300 years for somebody to go from a parallel arrangement to, uh, to a serial one? to produce a telescope or to produce a microscope? I don't know. It's an interesting question. I mean, this was close to 300 years. But once this was done, once you could you know, see farther and see smaller, there was an explosion in, uh, in instruments. So these were significant, but there really wasn't a lot of advancement. I call this invention without understanding. People did not understand refraction. So they really couldn't do design. You could put these, you, they could make the lens, and you could put the lens like this, and you could make a telescope, you could make a microscope, but to go the next step required an understanding of refraction. And here again, Refraction had been observed, I mean, long before the time of Christ. This is before common error. Um, even, you know, 200, you know, common error, people were able to measure this. For small angles, angle of incidence was the angle of, uh, of refraction. 1270, there it is again, you know, this, this starting to think about optics. Uh, somebody tried to actually measure refractive angles and from that derive a formula. Um, here, after you know, the telescope, the microscope were developed, Kepler took his hands at it, came up with this small, same small angle approximation and was stymied by, by the data. This data here was fraught with errors. And he tried to use that to develop this law of refraction. So it wasn't until 10 years later you have Snell's law. Independently, you have Descartes coming up with the same formula. And he, in fact, he gave um, 
primacy to Snell. Even though they had done it independently, he saw Snell's work and said, yes, he had done it first. And then after that, then you have the lens maker's formula. And then finally, the imaging equation. So here you have it. Refraction establishes optical design. So now we know how to shape lenses. We know how to set up an imaging system. And this is what people understood. So we, we had you know, reflection and refraction. The observations go back to antiquity. The you know, understanding what the, uh, the angles were in reflection here, 1621 Snell's law. The application, this was primarily mirrors. And then you start getting into lens design at this point. I come to this because the, it's not just the optics that makes imaging it's important. It's the stuff that goes around it, just like that packaging problem for spectacles. So what was important here was glass making and lens grinding. So let's step back. Glass making, a very ancient technology. But you know, about the time of the Romans, the invention of glass blowing, and then of course through the Roman Empire that gets spread throughout Europe. And here it is again, that same time frame, you have sort of a, you know, a blooming of glass making. And the Venetians were renowned for their, their glass, so much so that they moved all their factories to an island just off of Venice. And this I find you know, later, uh, I, what was happening was you know, the technology was growing. You've got some 200, 300 years later. This is a very strict non-disclosure agreement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I'll see, there's imprisonment, but then you could be put to death. If, if you gave away the secret, you could be put to death. Then along comes this publication, and again, you know, this is about the same time. You have Kepler with, uh, you know, with his book on, on optics right there, within one year of Kepler's dioptries. And basically what he did was he gave away the secrets how to make glass. And what this did was that basically neutered that. I mean, once this was published, people knew, now you have, you've got two important elements here. You know some, you have some idea of optical design and you know how to make good glass. So these two things together sort of propel optical design. I'm sorry? Did they kill him? I don't think so. I mean, this was, what, 60 years later? No, longer. 70 years later. Um, he, he was in Italy when this was published. I don't think anything happened to him. You know, at, at, at some point, just how do you enforce that? So now we have glass making, and we have all these instruments that are being made, and the ability to make the glass, you know, again, it's the quality of the materials and the ability to shape them, okay? It wasn't perfect, so what did people do? You do have a lot of aberrations in these systems, so if you go to uh, you know, very long focal lengths, you increase magnification, you minimize defects, and that's kind of what is being shown here. You, this is because of the state of the technology, this is what is driving you. These are the kinds of designs that you can make. Interesting. Now, after Neri's translation, you know, his work was in, uh, was in Latin. It's translated into English, and then you have uh, Ravenscroft who comes up with crown glass. I mean, the, the secrets are revealed. He can read it in English, and now he goes and he toys with the different chemical compositions, and he comes up with a completely different glass. This is going to have an effect on lens design. Uh, it takes some time before the first acromat, where you have glasses of two different dispersions that you combine to correct for chromatic aberration. I believe one of the reasons for this long delay is Newton said that there was no way that you could uh, achromatize using just a refractive system. And that was because the glasses that he had were all basically the same. So there wasn't enough difference in dispersion for him to say, I can therefore correct it. 
so because of newton's very strong influence it took a long time and hall was an amateur you know trying to remember what he was i think he may even been a minister but here you can see once people start looking at glass as a, as as a science and then as an engineering i mean here this is prior to 1880 this is this is your glass map when abby shot and zeiss get into it they i mean what made them famous was they looked at this as a science and then as an engineering and they expanded the glass map and then you can see you know we're spanning all of this and I'll eventually come back around when we start talking about negative refraction. But there you have it. I mean, this now, the fact that you can make acromats, changes the way people approach optical design. I'm not going to go into the story of diffraction, but there's a similar pattern that, that's taking place here. The observation of diffraction, 1665, what happened was around this period when people started investigating light and optics they started experimenting and this diffraction was observed uh, what was also observed was polarization um, you know by refringence all in the same period of time it wasn't understood until Fraunhofer got into the into the act so there's about 200 years here what you could actually do with it didn't really come into play you know, for another hundred years. And the key point here is, again, this, this ancillary technology. It's no longer a bulk effect. It's a microstructure patterning that, that you require to do this. And I was talking with uh, Raphael today and Bob McLeod about you know actually taking this now and shrinking it down so that you get even smaller and smaller features you know this is the classic diffractive optics approach you put down a layer of photoresist you um, expose with a binary mask you etch you repeat repeat the process you come you know if you do it a second time you come up with four layers in, uh, here. If you go a third time, you'll get eight phase levels. And you know, this is based on photolithography, direct writing with E-beam, and an ion beam. These are the kinds of structures that you get. And we're definitely pushing this now to smaller and smaller features. So you know, here, this is what I just talked about. We've got diffraction, and now bringing it back negative refraction, sort of turning this back on its head. Um, you know, first observed, uh, what, nine, ten years ago. It was predicted before that. Uh, it is based on being able to make very small features, fabricating very small features into, uh, into materials. And I think we're still waiting for that, you know, that killer app where this is really going to come into play. Uh, people talk about cloaking. Um, I feel cosite interference, you know, if you can solve that problem, makes more sense. It is a cloaking application. Uh, correcting for aberrations is probably interesting. If you can make materials, bulk materials, that have negative indices in the same way that acromats were made with different uh, dispersions, if you have negative and positive refraction, you should be able to design a system that reduces aberrations. So we're still waiting for this, uh, but you know, this is the progression. So that's how you make the optics. And, what I, and really all I was talking about there were still microscopes and telescopes and spectacles. Okay. Along comes recorded imaging. So everything else was with the human eye, seeing farther, seeing smaller, improving vision. Now we're going to replace the human eye with, by recording images. Okay, so you have the first recorded image, the 1837 daguerreotype. Uh, this is a reproduction of that. So now we can make photographs. Okay, I can record an image. And the interesting thing is with motion pictures, you know, I can record images in time. What does that do? 
Well, it's certainly a boon to history. I mean, that's, that's a scene in France in 1837, and we know what it looked like from that perspective that day. Uh, medicine and science and certainly entertainment. The interesting thing is, if I don't have to put my eye behind it, I can now have a remote camera. And the first kite photograph was taken in 1882. That's remote sensing. Okay. Uh, if I can do that, I can go into the invisible spectrum. I can now measure infrared and discover that there is another part of the spectrum and there is ultraviolet. The fact that I can measure things in time now allow me to measure things that are happening very quickly or happening very slowly. So now we've, we, can, we can introduce time in, in medicine and in science. But the rules of optical design do not change. This is, these are great applications, but it doesn't change the fundamental optics. Why? Because the optics is still doing everything. The optics limits your resolution. The film grain, I mean, there is a piece of film there. Okay, it's, it's going to limit noise, dynamic range, sensitivity, but I'm still forming the image with the optics. Okay, that's the case until you start getting into electronic detection of images. First you have in 1927 the image detector. I mean, this is an, an analog image detector. Then you have the charge coupled, uh, charge coupled device detector, the CCD, in 1969. What does that do? Real-time imaging, it's no chemical processing. Um, detection and, and storage are decoupled. Uh, and what this does is <clears throat> I now have an efficient format for storing and transmitting images. Up to this point, all I had were photographs. That was it. I made the record and that was the storage. And I could give it to you and you could look at it. And that was it. And I could measure, I could actually physically measure distances on that. But that was it. So now, with the electronic detection, this is decoupled. I can, I can look at real-time imaging. I don't have to go through my chemical process. And this does change. This does change what, the way we approach optical design. Image formation and image detection are no longer separable. If we go all the way back, um, I mean, you have a detector that has a certain size. And that's what's going to limit your resolution. I don't have to make the best optics because if I put that spot in the middle of a very large detector, I'm, I'm, it's overkill. So I actually want to do some matching here. So I'm going to match my optics to the detector. Uh, resolution, signal, and noise levels are limited by detection. The fact that I now have a detector that has a specific detector element that's this big and not that big uh, that changes the way I approach the design. Okay. So I'm going to run through this real quickly because now, I mean, now, now we're poised. The, we've got, you know, we've got spectacles, we have the birth of optical design, we've got metallurgy, glass making, we understand refraction people start investigating light. Then you've got recorded imaging, and about this time, um, you've got Maxwell coming out with his equations. Wave nature of light is established. Abbey uses that to improve the quality of imaging systems. A Little later, people start going further. They're exploring more and more about light. We get into the quantum nature of light. Uh, and then along comes I mean, it's interesting these two are, go together. There's an, this is sort of the birth of inform, information optics. I mean, certainly digital information. This is optical information. Linear systems formulation of optics. You know, what, what you see in Goodman's book was actually, was actually started formulating right about this time. The first book appears here. Then all of a sudden, the laser, and the laser influences off-axis holography. And then we get to these last two. And I'll throw in 
Okay, that's what I wanted. We're getting into signal processing here. This is significant because we now have an algorithm for doing something, and we can talk about optics taking a Fourier transform. This was something that allowed us to do that digitally. And the interesting thing is it was applied to making the first computer-generated hologram. We also have this, and these two things together, the electronic detection of images, the signal processing that started here, that's now going to change the way we, we look at imaging systems. I'm going to put this in here, but I'm not really going to talk about it. Uh, as we looked at, I mean, here, people started looking at the quantum nature of light, and 100 years later, they're actually using that to form images. And I'll I haven't used the term yet, but you know, this is a form of computational imaging. You cannot form these images without post-detection processing. So this relies upon what took place here. OK, so here we are. We now have electronic detection. Um, we've got signal processing. You know, image formation and image detection are now coupled. The optical design, though, is, is still decoupled. People are still using the old rules, conventional rules for optical design. That's what I said. You match the optical and electronic fields of view and instantaneous fields of view. That's the way people are trained. And despite this now, what we can do, there's, we still don't consider the post-detection processing as applied to these signals. Not until we have the cubic phase element. Now, there were people who were thinking along those lines. This is, this is now what I call the, the textbook case. How do you, does that make you feel old, Ed? It's a textbook case. Uh, the cubic phase element. This is a, a very nice pedagogical example for go, you know, breaking the old paradigms. That if you want to extend your depth of focus, if you want to have, capture an image all at once, where everything is in focus over a very broad volume, uh, what you do is you screw up the optics. You don't use the conventional ideas. You throw in an aberration because that aberration has properties that you like. I mean, these don't change. What that means is that actually simplifies the post-detection processing. So um, this is a view graph from, uh, from 1995. This is work that Ed did with a colleague of mine, Joe Vandergracht. Um, you know, we have a, an object here. Actually, what I didn't put in here is what this looks like in a conventional system. In fact, you can't see this, but the, you know, the ARL and this in focus are actually in two different planes. You have a single capture, you have a single <clears throat> Uh, a single process, post-detection, and you get an image where everything is in focus. So the idea now is that the burden of image formation is no longer solely on the optics. I can spread that burden. I can now go into the digital domain. And what that does is it changes the way I design the front end. So the front end and the back end I look at together, and I can actually simplify both if I look at the, the problem uh, to, as a whole. This is where you know, I come to my apology. This is, the, I, this is what I wanted to do at, at ARL. Apply these notions to millimeter waves. Um, Millimeter waves, I mean, why millimeter waves? Because you can see through obscurance there's a, a very a serious military problem. Uh, we've been in deserts uh, for the past, how many years, four or five years, and helicopters landing in deserts kick up a lot of dust. You can't see through that dust, um, and that is a problem. If you have a millimeter wave imaging system, you can see through the, uh, the dust. You can see through fog. This is important for harbor security. 
convoys in mountainous terrain. So you want to be able to see through the fog, see through the dust. Uh, a big area of application right now is seeing through textiles, finding that person with the suicide vest. So you can, you can detect concealed weapons. So these are the applications we are interested in. There's, you know, we have these two guys. Now we have, we have here two very nice cooperative targets. They're sitting there. One has a, you know, a gun in his belt, a knife. Uh, but they're sitting there and that's, you know, that's great if you're going through an airport. And in fact, uh, I noticed for the first time at Reagan National, they have a millimeter wave scanner that you can walk through. That's a cooperative target. You can have that person walk through this portal and this thing scans you and you stand there and we expect to be delayed and that's not a problem. What about that environment? I mean, we do want to find the person who's carrying the, that vest underneath their clothing. You know, as they're going to the wedding where they're going to, you know, th their intent is to kill people at the reception. How do you do that? You know, how do you do this in this environment? What you're going to need is something like that. You're going to have, I mean, the idea is it would be nice if you could put this on a van and go down a street and if there's something in here that nobody else can see and it just looks like a delivery truck, you know, maybe you can spot the guy with the, with, uh, the weapons under his clothing. So that really, it's a nice application for the extended depth of field because if I look at this scene, we have this gentleman in the back, this gentleman up close. You know, I don't know where that person's going to be as I'm driving down a street. I've got, you know, I would like to look out both sides. I've got a depth of field. The millimeter wave imaging systems actually have a very narrow depth of field. They have about, you know, a, a body length. Uh, it's about 12 inches, I mean, the system that we, that we looked at. But that's typical. So you don't have a very long time to look at somebody. You would like to be able to, you know, if you're in an airport, rather than doing this, you would like them to be able to walk through a volume and you observe them. Or here, scan through a volume, really without scanning. So that's a nice application for the cubic phase because I can take a snapshot and I can get the depth of field that I need. Um, this is a cubic phase element. The, this is about 60 centimeters. I think that's the largest cu cubic phase. Ed? <laughs> yeah. Um, and, you know, this is, this is the system we've got here, uh, a 94 gigahertz uh, antenna. Have a target. <clears throat> You know, we have an extended target here. Uh, millimeter waves are like uh, the infrared. You're actually looking for a temperature differential. So we illuminated this with a liquid nitrogen bath, you know, through this binary target. What we did was we then moved this target back and forth, captured the images here. And these are the results that we get. Um, without the cubic, a conventional imaging system Nominal focus was uh, 180 inches, uh, and as we move toward the, uh, the antenna, you can see you go very quickly out of focus. Uh, the depth of field is about 12 inches for this. When you put the cubic in, you can already see that, I mean, in comparison to this, uh, I definitely have a higher resolution here than I do there. You can actually see where the blur starts. I mean, that's constant. In, in all of these, uh, and you can see it's much narrower here. So that's without any processing. <clears throat> when you throw in the processing, um, I mean, it's debatable whether this is, this is better than that. I mean, there are a lot of errors that are introduced here, uh, but I mean, we certainly, we've enhanced the contrast here. We can see a uh, higher spatial frequency here than we can here or here. And what we did was, okay, a little more than 12 inches. We went from about a foot to a little more than five feet. Uh, it's at least 34 inches in front of the focal plane. So we can now look at somebody over this volume. So that is something that we've already demonstrated. 
Yes. Going back, even if your other image was out the uh, good phase, at the very top right, one in the focus has that thing that hangs over on the right. Okay. Where did that come from? That is. It's somehow, it's, it's a reflection off of this edge here. I mean, I, I don't know why we're getting it only on one side, but it's a reflection off of that back panel. I mean, it, yeah, you, you definitely can see it right there, and it, it's interesting. You can barely see it here, but it shows up there. But that's all that that is. Okay, show that we can, we can do things at millimeter waves. The goal is though, if I really want to put this on a van, and if I look at the technology that is out there, this is a millimeter wave imaging system that weighs a good 500 pounds. So that's a lot to carry around. That's one thing. The other thing is the detectors are expensive. This is what goes in the back of that. So there has been a lot of effort, there's been a lot of effort at DARPA to reduce the size of this, to reduce the cost of this. That's a program that a colleague of mine is involved in, millimeter wave detective technology, it's DARPA Miata. Basically, the idea is to make a millimeter wave focal plane. Uh, this is uncooled. Um, that's not my area. I can't say much more about it than that. I know that it's an uncooled detector array. We have, in fact, a 1 by 32 linear array that will be uh, demonstrated. We need to test these things, see how well they perform. But it's, it's definitely a significant savings in terms of cost and weight. Um, I thought I had another one in there. OK. Maybe not. Um, this is a critical point. Even if we could make them cheaper, if I consider my aperture, I mean, what I had, I had an antenna that was 60 centimeters, and if I'm going to put this on a van, that's probably about right, 60 centimeters. If I consider at, if I call it 100 gigahertz, my wavelength is 3 millimeters, okay? So if I have a 60 by 60 square centimeter aperture, the number of pixels, if I think about what's my resolution limit, it's only going to be 200 by 200. That's it. That physics will limit me to that. There will be no megapixel imagers on tactical air and ground platforms. By tactical, I mean it's a truck or it's a small plane. It's not going to be huge. So what I need to do is I need to increase the information per pixel. If this is all I've got, I want to make sure I get as much information through there as possible. And this is what I hope to complete this, this summer with the help of a graduate student from Duke University, uh, compressive imaging. Uh, if, I need to, if, if I'm going to have a limited amount of time, if I'm going to have a limited number of pixels, I want to make sure that I get as much information through that system as possible. You know, this is the classic way of looking at things. It's a convolution. And that system that we had was a single pixel detector. The way we created our images was scanning. Uh, and that's the way we use this. It's what I'm indicating here. Pixel by pixel, I scan out my image. Well, I don't want to do that. What I'd like to do is modify the antenna beam pattern, modify the scan pattern, and collect a fewer number of measurements to get the same information. And you know, that shows what, what we would like to do. That's where we're headed. And the goal then is, <clears throat> the whole vision is, all right, we've reduced the detector weight, thanks to DARPA. I uh, didn't talk about this. We have looked at. Uh, using diffractive optical elements to uh, get rid of some of the weight in the elements themselves, in the optical elements. There was a program at DARPA that was focused on computational imaging. The idea was to reduce the volume of the imaging system 
and yet maintain its performance. So we want to take a look at what was done under that program to see what can be applied to this, this part of the spectrum and then go the next step where we start getting into you know, the compressive imaging so that now we're increasing the information per measurement. This is our plan to go from this to this, take fewer measurements. So again, that's where we want to be. So this is my wrap up. Um, where are we? There are, there's definitely, there's old physics and new designs. That's what we're looking at with computational imaging. That we're increasing the coupling between image formation, post detection processing, going to multiple apertures, um, what Raphael is involved in, point spread function engineering. You know, it doesn't have to be a perfect point. I can spread the information out. If I look at other things that we can do right now, in fact, near field imaging is probably not that new. Quantum imaging is making an appearance. Where's the technology? Well, we've got it in the optics, engineered materials. You know, there it is, metamaterials, negative index materials, dynamic elements. If I really want to take that you know, millimeter wave computational imaging system, I want to have a spatial light modulator in there. And I want to be able to do things dynamically. Um, detectors, if we look at visible, it's still going to be smaller pixels, larger arrays, different geometries, putting signal processing in the pixels, changing the substrates. All of this will impact what it is we can do with the imaging systems and then we shouldn't forget the back end. There's a lot of nonlinear processing taking place. And then the implementations, looking at different hardware now for doing the implementation. So where are we going? If you look at where digital cameras are right now, or what, uh, even what DARPA did, we're enhancing cameras. We're making them, you know, same performance, but reducing the size, weight, and power. So this is something that you know, we can make a very tiny imaging system, but a very high performance system. I can enhance the image that I capture. Um, that's what the extended depth of field gives me. It gives me more information than I got from a conventional image. Expanded dynamic range, increased resolution. Um, trying to remember where this came from, uh, em em embedded photoshopping. The idea is, yes, the idea is that I capture a lot of information, but then I can sit at my computer and actually figure out what it is I want to see from all the data that I've collected. So on the fly, I can figure out you know, what's important to me. Um, you know, this one is interesting, you know, enhancing recorded imaging. I can, with quantum imaging, I can see beyond the line of sight. So, enhance cameras, enhance images. Okay, we're back to enhancing human vision. So now we're going beyond, you know, we've got 3D, multispectral, polarimetric. Recording different things than we have in the past. And then the ultimate goal for, you know, certainly people in the military, Enhancing human cognition, you know, the goal in a lot of military applications is information extraction. We basically want to get rid of the image analyst. You know, is it possible to get information out of these data processing, image data processing systems? There are, you know, we can certainly do it pixel based. Uh, Mark Neifeld at the University of Arizona likes to talk about beyond pixels, task specific imaging. To do this, it's going to require a lot of feedback, a lot more of dynamic elements and adaptive processing. I mean, that's a long way off, but I believe that's the future. And are there any questions? <laughs> any questions? Uh, you mentioned that diffraction limits the number of pixels in your millimeter sure. imaging systems to order of few thousands, right? Right. So I'm wondering, in such a scenario, what is the real motivation for compressive sensing? You, you just have a few thousand pixels. 
Um, the one hope is what, what I'd like to do is if I'm, if I'm going down the street, I mean, it's one thing to stare at a scene and scan. I don't have the luxury of being able to stare at a scene. I actually want to, you know, I want to do this. So the, the details and all of that are actually, is there a way that I can scan? And what I'm doing is I'm sort of sampling in, in time and space that I have to look at. And that's, that's really where the compression is coming in. And it's because I've only got a few, I've only got a few samples that I can take. I mean, I'm motivated by saying I'm only going to have an aperture that, that's, that's this big, so I've only got two, 200 by 200. But, but the real problem is I need to sample in time and space. And that's where the compression is coming from. How do I do that and, and retain the resolution? Any other questions? Yeah. Um, a little blurry. Yes. Uh, how much better can you make that? Because I don't want a bunch of guys like undressing me while I'm watching. Um, That's a little freaky. That is an it is an issue, and it is an issue with the millimeter wave scanners that are out there. And um, I mean, if if I stand there and I integrate long enough, it it can be fairly detailed. Um, <laughs> There are, I believe, in those systems, there are, there are privacy issues that have been addressed. And basically what happens is the images are sent somewhere else. So it's not the person, it's not the TSA person who's standing right there who, who has x-ray vision. It's somebody else. Your, your face is covered. Parts of your body are covered. You know, if you're carrying something, it, it's going to be here. Okay. That's how that's been addressed. Right, but but from that standpoint, I mean, you've had a mammogram. No, no? oh, we can talk about that. But uh, but I mean, it it's looked at in the same way. I mean, it's it's clinical from that standpoint. Okay. Oh, in the street. Well. I mean, we're, we're the DOD and, you know, we can do what we want, right? Um, I mean, from, <laughs> I, you know, pardon me, par pardon me, I, I, hadn't gone, I hadn't gone that far. I'm still, I'm still trying to find the guy, you know, with the suicide vest on. Um, I, I have been cautioned, you know, talking with sergeants, they know what their troops are capable of. So it is probably something we should look at. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, if, if you don't form the image and you just say, if you've got a video image and say, check that person. But isn't that a motivation for target specific images? Where you just look at the sure. specific target? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, w w with all of this stuff, there are always questions of privacy. Any other questions? Um, how do I do that? I mean, in the same way that I, the simplest answer is I could make the cubic phase and I can put it in front of that system. Therefore, I can make similar elements and that's, I mean, what I've done is I've changed the point spread function. But you need a bunch of those. I need a bunch of those, which is why we're not doing it that way. But that is what we need to do. Um, and, I mean, for, for proof of principle, we will be making up a whole bunch of masks that you know we put in our imaging system. That is the motivation then to develop a millimeter wave spatial light modulator. So another DARPA program. Hey Kevin. You mentioned negative index materials a bunch of times. One of the claims about them is they get beyond the diffraction limit of perfect imaging. Is that the <coughs> prognosis of your terror imaging? Oh. Make uh, perfect images that way? No. Uh, and I guess uh, 
I mean, the, the statement is true, but under what conditions? I mean, if I'm near field to near field, you know, then I, and, and, and even in that case, does it, really, does it really make any sense to talk about, you know, the Raleigh limit and I'm getting below that? Um, I'm, not, I'm not looking at any metamaterials in, in the system that I'm talking about to, to do anything fancy. Definitely not. I mean, what, what I'm more concerned about is, I mean, what I'm very concerned about is in all of this stuff, in the millimeter wave, the phenomenology is different than in visible. We have less signal. Everything I'm talking about here is going to inject a lot of noise. So my concern is being able to do the experiments, characterize the experiments, and take a look at that to see how much, how much I gain, because there's a lot, that, there's a lot of cost involved. Um, negative index refraction, I'm not looking at in this. I think negative index refraction in terms of imaging, I mean, when you can, when you can use a negative index material to do far field imaging and you get that kind of performance, then I'm impressed. I really think that, you know, that's why I had the, the question mark there. If you can make a bulk negative material and then I put that with my positive material and I can correct aberrations, I mean, now I've got a hybrid system. I really think that's the application. I mean, all this stuff about perfect imaging, I have some problems with. Any other questions? Okay. Sure.